Hello and welcome to Dub Biology Apes Lessons to Go. In this video we'll be exploring pesticides and pest control. A pest is basically any species that will compete with us for food, invade our lawns and gardens, destroy wood and houses, spread disease, or is simply a nuisance. Now most of the time nature takes care of these pests through natural enemies like predators and parasites, as well as disease organisms that will naturally kill our pests. When nature uh, does not completely eliminate the pest as we would like, we can apply chemicals known as pesticides. Pesticides, also known as biocides, are basically chemicals that are designed to kill organisms that we consider to be undesirable. For example, insecticides to kill insects, or herbicides to kill weeds, fungicides, and rodenticides. Now, the application of these pesticides are as varied as their chemical composition. Some pesticides are sprayed directly on the pest. Others are placed for secondary contact so that uh, the organism uh, can take that uh, pesticide back to their, their homes and uh, kill the entire colony. Sometimes it's ingested, which results in their death, or in some ca cases, uh, the pesticide is only acting as a repellent. Now, there are two general classes of pesticides, broad spectrum and narrow spectrum. Broad spectrum agents are toxic to many different species, and when applied, not only will kill our pests, but they oftentimes also kill non-target species. Narrow spectrum uh, pesticides are better in that they're effective only against a narrowly defined group of organisms, so to only kill ants, or to only kill uh, roaches, so that other uh, insect species, potentially those that are beneficial, are left unharmed. Now. Our pesticides are something that we actually began to borrow from nature itself. For almost 225 million years ago, plants have been producing chemicals to ward off or poison herbivores that feed on them. Through a process known as coevolution, the predators would overcome the plant defenses by natural selection, and the plants would then need to develop new defenses. Or, people would have to develop artificial chemicals to kill or repel those pests. Our first generation of pesticides were actually those that we derived from nature. Sulfur uh, was used in the early 500 BCs uh, to kill certain uh, pest species. To kill rats and other rodents, uh, toxic compounds of arsenic, lead, and mercury were used in the 1400s, but it was abandoned in the early 1900s when increasing number of human poisonings were, uh, were occurring. Nicotine sulfate began to be used in the 1600s to derived from the tobacco plant, um, and this is still used today as a very effective insecticide. Pyrethrum and rotenone uh, were developed in the mid-1800s by uh, extraction from particular plant species, and once again, they're still used today due to their overall effectiveness. The second generation pesticides were actually those that derived from synthetic sources. One of the first was developed into an insecticide in 1939 by Paul Mueller. This chemical was known as DDT. Now, it was known um, as an organophosphate chemical that it was a very potent insecticide in the early 1800s, but it wasn't really developed and brought to market until those early 1900s. As a result of its overall effectiveness, DDT became the first pesticide of the so-called second-generation pesticides, and Mueller went on to win the Nobel Prize in 1948 for its overall discovery. Chemists have been developing hundreds of synthetic organic chemicals for use as pesticides. In fact, worldwide, about 2.3 million metric tons of pesticides are used every year, about a pound for each person on Earth. Now, the use of pesticides do have certain positives. One, by eliminating uh, disease-causing and parasite-containing uh, uh, insects, it allows for people to live longer in certain environments. By destroying the mosquitoes that carry malaria or the ticks that carry bubonic plague, we're able to save human lives. Pesticides also can increase food supplies and lower food costs. About 55% of crops are lost before harvest due to pests. When we apply pesticides, that allows for more crops to be harvested. With that, the pesticides will then also increase the profits for farmers. For about every dollar spent on pesticides, you get $4 of profit from the crops that you harvest. Now, unfortunately, if that pesticide has some harmful side effects, it reduces our overall profit in half. 
Additional pros would be that pesticides oftentimes work faster and better than other alternatives. While there are natural ways to eliminate uh, pests, like for instance, introducing um, a natural predator into an environment, like bringing in um, you know, truckloads of ladybugs to kill aphids, a pesticide is going to work a lot faster and better than the overall alternatives. Um, they also have a longer shelf life and they can be easily shipped and applied. Now, when we compare their benefits, it reduces their overall health risks, making them seem a little more insignificant. And on top of that, there are safer, more effective pesticides being developed. Now, when using pesticides, there are a number of cons, though. One big one is genetic resistance. When pesticides are inappropriately applied, the pest organisms can actually develop resistance to that pesticide after a short time, causing what we call a pesticide treadmill. So when we apply our, uh, our pesticide, it's possible that there could be individuals in that population that have a natural resistance as a result of a mutation that they have in their genes. If we do not find a way to eliminate those survivors, they will go on to reproduce, passing that gene on to the next generation, making it much more difficult um, to eliminate that particular pest. As the pest becomes resistant to the pesticide, you have to have larger doses or more frequent doses of pesticides to kill them. And so we call that a pesticide treadmill. It's kind of like a positive feedback loop, an ever-increasing amount of pesticides that need to be applied to be able to keep your pests low. An additional negative is that broad-spectrum insecticides will actually kill natural predators and parasites that may have been maintaining the population of that pest species at very reasonable levels. For example, wolf spiders, wasps, and predatory beetles all do a great job of eliminating certain pests. With their removal, the only way to eliminate your pest species is by applying more and more pesticide. Increased pesticide use could actually lead to unwanted death of wildlife or to cause cancer and birth defects in humans as many uh, chemicals that are found in uh, pesticides can be mutagenic or teratogenic. Accidents in pesticide manufacturing plants can expose workers, families, and sometimes the general public to toxic chemicals. For example, in 1984, we saw one of the world's worst uh, chemical accidents. At the Union Carbide plant in India, uh, there was a gas leak of some of the chemicals that were used to make a particular insecticide. Uh, those pesticides uh, went uh, through a small village uh, and led to a lot of immediate deaths and have continued to cause harm to the population around Bhopal, India as we see increased rates of birth defects and a lower life expectancy. So where does the pesticides all go? Now unfortunately only about 2% of the sprayed uh, insecticide by air will actually reach its target pests. And less than 5% of herbicides applied reach their target weed. So the pesticides that don't reach their target will actually end up in the air in the surface water, in the groundwater, in bottom sediments, on the food and other non-target organisms. And it can lead to uh, the death of these non-target species. The pesticides themselves vary in persistence, the length of time that they remain in the environment. Highly persistent pollutants will actually last a long time in the environment. Many of these chemicals can be absorbed and stored in specific organs or tissues of organisms at high levels. This is a concept known as bioaccumulation because these chemicals are accumulating primarily in our fat tissue, uh, which is not usually um, metabolized and removed from the body um, because we're storing our fat. As these toxins actually pass through the food chain, the concentrations will increase in the higher level consumers a concept known as biomagnification because as we move up the trophic pyramid we actually see an increase in that chemical and their tissues and this can have catastrophic effects. A great example of a substance that showed bioaccumulation and biomagnification was DDT. DDT was a miraculous insecticide and it did a great job at killing insects but it also had many harmful environmental effects. Uh, DDT would be in low concentrations in the lower uh, parts of the food chain. As it moved up through the trophic levels, it would biomagnify. 
increasing in concentration until it reached levels that were detrimental to many uh, species. DDT then, in predatory birds, would cause the eggshells to weaken. So birds like the peregrine falcon and bald eagle, when they sat on their nest, it would cause their eggs to crack and a lower amount of babies were able to be born. As a result, these bird species were thrust into an endangered species status. By banning DDT in 1972 and having protect, protection strategies for these uh, predatory birds, um, we were able then to help them to recover, and now the bald eagle is pretty much off of most states' endangered species list. Unfortunately, due to its efficacy, there are many countries that are still using DDT, and so it's still present in our environment and can still be part of the food chains that we are a part of. There are many laws and regulations that attempt to maintain a level of safety when we're using pesticides. The Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA, amended in 1972, has many elements. First of all, the EPA must approve the use of all consumer pesticides. The EPA is then responsible for setting the tolerance levels, or the amount of toxic pesticide residue that can legally remain on a crop. As a result of FIFRA, there are 55 active pesticides that are banned in the U.S., but they may be used and shipped elsewhere. Now, there are many criticisms of FIFRA. The National Academy of Sciences says that the federal laws are not adequate. About 98 of potential risk of cancer could be eliminated if the pesticide residue on food was actually put to zero. There are a lot of untested pesticides that actually remain on the market for a long time because there are built-in appeals that can keep those dangerous products on the shelves for up to 10 years as the EPA is testing them to see their levels of safety. And then finally, because the EPA is a government agency, citizens can't sue the EPA for not enforcing FIFRA. Another major law that helps to maintain a level of safety with pesticides in our food is the 1996 Food Quality Protection Act. This requires that food only have a reasonable amount of pesticide um, on it. It requires manufacturers to demonstrate that any active ingredients in their products are safe for infants and children. It requires the EPA to consider the exposure of more than one pesticide when setting pesticide tolerance levels because of the concept of synergy. Two or more pesticides working together can have an increased impact on our health. And so we have to look at what happens when you have more than one uh, pesticide present. And then finally, the EPA is responsible with the Food Quality Protection Act to develop programs to screen the ingredients for their level of safety. Now, the ultimate goal of pest management and pesticide use is integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is an effective and environmentally sensitive approach to pest management that relies on the use of a combination of common sense practices. IPM programs use current, comprehensive information on the life cycle of pests and their interaction with the environment. This information, in combination with available pest control methods, is used to manage pest damage by the most economical means and with the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. The IPM approach can be applied to both agriculture and non-agricultural settings, such as the home, garden, and workplace. Integrated pest management takes advantage of all the appropriate pest management options, including, but not limited to, the judicious use of pesticides, in contrast, organic food production applies many of the same concepts as IPM, but limits the use of pesticides to those that are produced from natural as opposed to synthetic uh, sources. Integrated pest management isn't a single pest control method, but rather a series of pest management uh, evaluations, decisions, and controls. In practicing IPM, growers who are aware of the potential for pest infestation follow a four-tiered approach. First, we'll want to set thresholds. Before taking any pest control action, we have to set an action threshold, which is the point at which the pest populations or environmental conditions indicate that pest control action must be taken. Citing a single pest doesn't always mean that pest control is needed. The level at which pests will either become an economic threat is critical to guiding future pest control decisions. We then have to monitor and identify those pests. Not all insects, weeds, and other living organisms actually require control. Many organisms are innocuous, and some are even beneficial. 
Integration pest management programs work to monitor for pests and identify them accurately so that appropriate control decisions can be made in conjunction with those action thresholds. The monitoring and identification removes the possibility that pesticides will be used when they're not really needed or that the wrong kind of pesticide will actually be used. As a first line of pest control, Integrated Pest Management works to manage the crop, the lawn, or indoor space to prevent the pests from becoming a threat. In an agricultural crop, this may mean using cultural methods such as rotating crops or selecting pest-resistant varieties and planting pest-free rootstock. These control methods can be very effective and cost-effective in, uh, in present little to no risk to people and the environment. Now once monitoring, identification, and action thresholds indicates that pest control is required and preventative me methods are no longer effective or available, the integrated pest management programs then evaluate what's going to be the proper control method for both effectiveness and risk. Effective, less risky pest controls are chosen first, including highly targeted chemicals such as pheromones to disrupt pest mating or mechanical control such as trapping or weeding. If further monitoring identifications and action thresholds indicate that the less risky controls aren't working, then we use additional pest control methods, such as a targeted spraying of pesticides and a broadcast spraying of nonspecific pesticides would be the very, very last resort.